This is Our View, proudly brought to you by the people who work for you, the members of the Washington Federation of State Employees. To keep traffic on our freeways safely moving, the Washington Department of Transportation has incident response technicians who provide assistance to motorists. The day our producer rode along, it showed that these state employees need to be ready for everything from a stalled car to life-threatening emergencies. Well, there was a call that came across the state patrol radio and about a vehicle that went off the roadway and it was high, traveling at a high rate of speed and that was all that was known at the time and the location was given so we decided to go to that location we weren't specifically called like a lot of times we are called to um, certain incidents but as happens oftentimes we'll go just to see if we can be of assistance to the troopers and in this case uh, we were needed because once we got there we found out that um, it was a medical condition the vehicle was off the roadway in the grass so we were requested by state patrol to close the right lane with flares and cones and signs that's uh, what we did was close that right lane secure the scene for all emergency responders. With the situation that occurred and the focus being on the medical condition of the person that was being attended to, the state patrol needed assistance from someone to protect them and secure that scene. Incident response provides safety for the traveling public. We try to sign the road with properly with crash ahead right lane closed in this case transition left and give the motorists plenty of forewarning as to what they need to do draw them basically a picture of what we're asking them to do help us out the motoring public can uh, just be aware if they see signs or flares, um, any kind of pre-warning devices, like in this case, crash ahead or um, right lane close, and if those signs are set in an emergency situation and the flares are out, that means that those lanes are closed. So if, if we can just get motors to slow down, it really is helpful to us. It just allows us to do our jobs quicker and safer. In these emergency situations, it, it's a bad time to uh, be on the cell phone or playing with the stereo. It's very important to watch and sit, stay focused on what is going on because if, if there are red lights or any type of emergency lights and warnings, then there are um, possible collisions ahead and um, lane close ahead. We're trying to assist motorists any way that we can. If, we, if they need some fuel, we have extra fuel that we can get them so that they can get off the freeway and get to a gas station. Their car is disabled. We have the equipment where we can push them off the freeway or tow them off the freeway, um, get them to a safe location and they, they can assess their vehicle. Often people don't seem to have the right equipment or their spare tire could be low on air and so we, we have uh, compressors where we can fill their tires. Just about anything people need we carry with us because we try to be prepared. So we are trying to keep traffic flowing as safely as possible and if any incidents do occur we're trying to stay focused on securing those scenes and preventing secondary collisions from occurring. A lot of satisfaction really, I believe, um, 
working in incident response, just it, it feels really good to know that um, people are really appreciative of what we do for them, especially if their vehicle's disabled or they're in any kind of a dangerous situation and, and we're able to help them. Um, it, it just really feels great. It was a year ago this month that flooding was widespread across southwest Washington. Hard hit was Lewis County, where the state's disaster outreach service workers are still helping people through the recovery. When your entire home or business is wiped out, it can easily be a year and then some for recovery. The best part of disaster outreach services is that it has continued for one year. It wasn't a short 30, 60 day program. We are still out in the community working with people who still do not have walls on their houses. It's a long process because we've had at least 1,600 homes and 40 miles of roads that washed out in Lewis County. It's taken a lot of time and energy to get it back so that people can have their livelihood as they had before the flood. It is the most awesome, incredible job. When we arrive at someone's doorstep, I have never heard the words, where have you been? It's thank you for coming back and continuing to be here. That has been the most wonderful part of this job is that it doesn't feel like a job. Every day is exciting. I pretty much work seven days a week. I take the hours that I can and uh, maybe it's a three hour day and the next day is 12. It's just a matter of being there when the people need us. The phone rings. We have an 800 line that I answer seven days a week and do our best to just be there when the crisis is happening because when people need you to listen, it's not just nine to five Monday through Friday. Uh, December 3rd, uh, we woke up to water at our front door and ended up at 3.30 that afternoon being hauled off our roof by helicopter. The, the adventure from there was number one, that the house survived the flood and then the overwhelming support and assistance we had from people throughout the community, whether it was church groups, uh, friends and family, to organizations that showed up to help us dig out the mud and begin the destruction process before we could be, re begin rebuilding. The, the outreach agency provided a great networking opportunity and a connecting resource so that we could had somebody to go to when we had a particular need or something that we wanted. We had a central agency and they kind of served as a networking opportunity to provide other resources. So if we needed an electrician, we could call them and say, what resources do you have that might help us here? So number one, I think, was a networking uh, option that they provide. The other thing that they provide is just somebody that cared, um, the, that sent folks out on a regular basis to touch base. How are things going? What are your needs yet? Um, especially in the latter part, the last several months where the immediate need has kind of died down. They were still there, and it was the outreach folks that were stopping or calling, you know, what else can we do for you? Who can we put you in contact with? What other things do you need that, that we might be able to help with? And so I think the continuity of the caring and the concern, as well as the networking, has been the biggest thing that we've we've taken advantage of, I might say, because we've taken advantage of it. They were there and, and, and willing to help, and so we took advantage of that. I think there's still a lot of people out there that don't know there are state agency or state-funded agencies that are still helping with the recovery. I think it's, it's viewed as part of the recovery effort, and I don't think a lot of people take time or are concerned about where the resources are coming from. It's just because of the need that we have, we don't always pay attention to where that resource is coming from. We're just looking for help. And so yeah, who'd have thought that the state had funds available? I mean, yeah, right after the flood, we got some food stamps on the emergency food stamp issues. And a lot of people, that was the state assistance. Um, I still think there's a lot of people out there that don't understand that the outreach services are being provided through state resources. 
we appreciate so much what they've done for us and, and are overwhelmed with the opportunities that we still have because they still are there for us and we know that we can go to them and say, hey, you got any connections here? What about this? We still need this. Where are you at with, with this aspect of the program? In this month's Labor History Report, Ross Reeder reminds us the concept of a carpenter's union was already hundreds of years old, even 2,000 years ago. For the past several years, in the annual labor history calendar published by the Pacific Northwest Labor History Association, we have noted the 25th of December as the birthday of Jesus, a carpenter, actual date unknown. Over the past year, I have been slowly reading a two-volume history by one C. Osborne Ward, father, by the way, of lesser-known 20th century American composer Frank Ward. The title of the book is The Ancient Lowly, A History of the Ancient Working People from the Earliest Known Period to the Adoption of Christianity by Constantine. The first volume is co copyrighted 1888. The second volume was copyrighted in 1900. The books were originally published by Charles H. Kerr and Company, a Chicago cooperative kept alive these days, much by the work and support of the Illinois Labor History Society and the industrial workers of the world. Anyway, these two books have been a source of more exciting wows about ancient worker organization than a guy my vintage should have to experience. Take a look around the edges of these two books and see all the pink stickies, those are some of the wows I've noted so I don't lose them. Did you ever see the Kirk Douglas movie in which he played the Roman slave Spartacus? Spartacus was a real person, and his life described by Ward in volume one follows closely the novel by Howard Fast on which the movie was released, was based, or did I get that backwards? Spartacus led, though not the first recorded strike, his strike was about 200 years before the beginning of the Christian era. And not too many centuries before that era that our tradition starts in late December, two brothers, Moses and Aaron, led a strike of Jewish slave workers. It was a big time strike. The pharaohs had the Jews making bricks, but decided not to supply the proper materials. So after attempting mediation, Moses and Aaron led the Jews on strike, right out of Egypt. Finally, at the time of the life of Jesus, the Carpenters' Union in Phoenicia and Palestine was at least 700 years old, and we think it's a big deal to celebrate a centennial. Since we're recording this telling of the story in June, I hope that by the time you hear it, I finish the 1,400 pages of the wow-filled history of the ancient lowly. This has been Our View, brought to you by the members of the Washington Federation of State Employees. We remind you, when you accept a paycheck for your hard work, you don't give up your rights. Happy holidays, and please join us again.